commitment, look back here. This tall, good-looking gentleman, his wife's at this table as well. Dr. Littman, guys, listen to me. I want everybody to know that Dr. Littman made all of this possible. He paid for his own life. And a few people in this room that don't have a uterus. Half, half the population doesn't have a uterus yet. It's the number two surgery done in the United States. And the most common reason is not cancer of the uterus, which would be appropriate. It's for these benign tumors. Average age of hysterectomy in this country is less than 40. And I spoke at Tuskegee University in front of several hundred young women, three of whom came up to me after my talk on UFE crying because they were in their 20s and already had a hysterectomy. None of them wanted it, but they were suffering, and I get it. When you're suffering with fibroids, the bleeding, the pain, the month after month, not only is it a physical ailment with the chronic fatigue and anemia and all the worry, but there's also the mental aspect of the dread and going through and pushing through. Doc, I gotta keep it moving. I don't, I just, I can't be off. I gotta, I gotta keep it moving. So there's a physical and a mental anguish to go through this, you know, suffering with fibroids. So they gave in, not knowing about UFE. Most physicians, even though we've been doing this here, and this is available throughout the country, it's not just here in Atlanta with us, but um, you can get UFE at any, throughout the country. That should not be an issue. What the issue is, is the gatekeepers of women's health are letting women down. They are not telling women that that's an option. They're only giving the surgical options, and women are entitled to know all the options. How are you gonna make the best choice for what you want if you're only given the surgical choices? So naturally, a number of women choose hysterectomy because that's the only option on the table, and they're tired of suffering. In fact, there are over one million women right now suffering, we call them the silent sufferers, they don't want surgery, they don't want hysterectomy, I don't blame them. And they just pad themselves up with all sorts of double, triple pads, diapers, you name it, extra change of clothing, they just, and they ain't having hysterectomy. But they, we could, if there's so many people like them that we could help if they only knew about UFE. But it's clear, numerous studies show most physicians won't mention it. And what's worse is they'll tell women, if you're done having your children, you don't need that uterus anymore. Just throw it out, throw it in the pan, throw it in the bucket. I'm here to tell you, your uterus is not the appendix, okay? Throw the appendix away if it's inflamed. Your uterus ain't the appendix. There are consequences for women that lose their uterus. I'm sure you know that. You may be one of them, or you know your mom, your mom, your auntie. Psychological issues post hysterectomy. I see a lot of nodding heads. Just like a man being castrated, and there's no way to predict who that's going to be. Sexual dysfunction. You, you want to get like these are young women, average age less than 40, and I say hey, some in their 20s. All of a sudden now, loss of libido, loss of orgasm, a lot of sexual dysfunction. Urinary leaking. Next time you go into a Kroger or a Publix or a Walgreens where, you, where they sell adult diapers, who I think needs to wear an adult diaper? Who should be on the package? It's a marketing, you know, this is, and you're seeing her from behind, <laughs> and she's got this little, like, thing going, and she's, scoo she's scooching out her skinny jeans over her adult diaper, yes. and there's some cornball thing saying, no one's gonna know you're seeing What? What in the world? I want to know why that woman needs a diaper. Answer me that question. No, you won't. You won't get that one. Nope. So we got to stop this. This is the most unnecessary surgery done in the United States. It's common. It's happening. I'll ask you this question: Why are we, we meaning medicine, not me personally, why are we essentially amputating? young black women for benign disease. 
Please answer yeah. that for me. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. Money. Like Money. Man, Money. What you, you say? Birth control. Money. Birth control. It's, <laughs> it's so interesting and nobody's talking about it. Nope. Nobody. You guys, you guys have any questions? I have a question. Kayla, can okay. you guys line up with Kayla for questions so we can get ready for lunch? Five questions over here with Kayla. I have One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So my mother was in her mid-30s um, uncontrollable cycle. So she got a uterine ablation, complications with that, and she got a hysterectomy. And she, okay. Let me stop with that because people might not know what that is. So, Kayla, you said a uterine a ablation. An ablation is a procedure where you burn, typically, or sometimes freeze, but typically burn the lining of a woman's uterus. And there are two types of bleeding. There are the causes of bleeding that are due to something structural in the uterus. Fibroids being number one. Fibroids is the most common reason why women have heavy periods. So there are structural causes of heavy bleeding, fibroids being the number one. And then there are these non-structural causes, much less common, like thyroid disease or polycystic ovarian syndrome or you know, other ovulatory dysfunction or bleeding disorders. Those are much less common. And that's why you know, people that know me know that I'll talk to anybody to listen. We're, we go all over talking to group, women's groups, African-American groups, sororities, et cetera. I was at Tuskegee, I've been all over the area um, talking about this. We just need to share this information. Uh, a lot of times there is a fair amount of period shame, and that plays into this, that people, there's a period shame that we have to get over, or, or we just don't talk about periods in our family. You, you've got to talk about it. you got to talk about it. Mothers, daughters, um, aunties, uh, everyone's got to talk about it. Uh, and information is power. And so share this information um, with everyone. Social media is a great way to do that. That fibroid um, conversation is um, serious to me. Raise your hand if you've had fibroids. Raise your hand if you've had fibroid surgery. Raise your hand if your fibroids have come back. Raise your hand if they told you as you get older the fibroids will disappear. Yeah, we got a lot of things to unpack. Yes. About 30,000 women instead of 30 million women, it gets $94 million in research. Over $3,000 per person. So you get a condition that affects African-American women, and a lot of other women too, 50 cents. Versus this relatively rare condition, cystic fibrosis, that affects primarily Caucasian women, getting three grand per person affected. So first off, we gotta fix that. We gotta, we gotta find out where fibroids come from. But once fibroids come on the scene, we know they grow with estrogen. Now, estrogen, that's why fibroids can grow rapidly during a pregnancy and why they tend not to be an issue for most women when they're in menopause. So estrogen is key. Now, hormones are pervasive in the food supply, even in the water, unfortunately. So you said diet. Yes, because the more body fat you have on you, estrogen is stored and produced in fat. So. That's one of the reasons. In general, African-American women have more body fat on them than other racial groups. And it's one of the things we can try to do something about because if you can affect, because everybody knows what their ideal body weight should be for their frame. No one's saying you gotta be skinny, you don't. But everybody kind of knows what that ideal weight is. And you, if you can get to that ideal weight, lose that excess body fat, you will improve your fibroid symptoms. You'll also improve your cardiovascular health. Because one thing is, I mean, we need you all to be here. And there's nothing more important than your health, period. So you can work on your fibroid health at the same time you're improving your overall cardiovascular health. One other thing that's really important that's not talked about very often, vitamin D. Vitamin D is so important. It's not, technically it's not a vitamin, it's really a hormone. But be that as it may, only 10% of African-American men or women have 
adequate vitamin D. It is the most powerful anti-fibroid growth entity that we have. So, and so if you only 10% only have adequate vitamin D, you know, you're gonna have fibroid issues. Whereas if you have a normal vitamin D, you are much less likely to suffer with fibroids. But I'm gonna keep saying, even with menopause, I just believe that a lot of it, I hate to say it, I never went through flashes or anything, but my doctor told me something my diet. You know, the hormones, chickens have hormones, the dairy products. Change your diet first, right, and foremost. Meat, y'all still eating spare ribs in the South. <laughs> Hormone-rich foods like red meat, non-organic chicken dairy, uh, eat more colored fruits and vegetables, like mom always told you, because they have flavonoids in them, and flavonoids will block an important enzyme and estrogen production, so there are things you have control over, like your diet, exercise, lose excess body fat, vitamin D, and there are things you can't control, you can't pick your parents. Genetics. That's a lot, right? A lot to unfold. Let me ask you this, I had a surgery, Laparoscopic. What was that? What did they do to me? Yeah, there's two types in general, two main types of surgery. There is open surgery, where they are literally cutting you open, either horizontally, like a cesarean section, horizontally, or if you've got a really big uterus, vertically, breastbone to pubic hairline, or if they think they can try to do you horizontally and they end up they can't, you get the old upside down T. Horizontal, then vertical. That's brutal. So that's open surgery. Metal tubes into those little short incisions, blow up your belly with carbon dioxide, and put. And they operate through these metal straws, these metal tubes that are put in. Now, the two varieties of laparoscopic are who's holding the instruments. If a human surgeon is holding the instruments, that is traditional laparoscopic surgery. If a robotic arm is holding the instruments and being manipulated by the surgeon playing a 3D video game at the other end of the OR, that's robotic laparoscopic surgery. I'm not suffering with fibroids right now. Remember, 95% of us probably will be by the age of 50. Wow. And, and that's, if you guys don't know Ebony, Ebony is a dynamic um, publicist. Um, she works with Dr. Littman and she's now the publicist for Publicist for the foundation. So, guys, give it up for the reporter. She's a real guy in the And he's a very young woman. Um, you guys have any other? This is really interesting, right? And you said 50. I thought it was like by the age of 40, women will be diagnosed with um, fibroid, uh, with fibroids. Well, I mean, you can see them. African American women get more fibroids than anybody else. They get them earlier in life, say the few teenagers that have actually. Or African Americans. They get them more commonly, earlier in life, they tend to be bigger, they're more likely to get hysterectomy. We want to stop that. We want to stop hysterectomies for women that don't want them and don't need them. That person can you know, write down notes. Because it's a lot to, you know, we, our consults are like 45 minutes long. It's a lot. Um, and so we go through thoroughly the, the, all the symptoms and the imaging and it's, it's a lot, and what's, so... What's the first console like when we come in? It, so I a, come to you, what yeah, happens? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like this. It's, okay. it's consultative, okay. no, it's not an exam. Okay. We, we have the notes from your gynecologist to see the recent stuff, make sure your pap smear is current and so forth. Um, and then we go over the symptoms. Heavy bleeding, pelvic pain, urinary frequency, what have you. And we go through each of those individually. And then we go and look at the MRI. Everybody's had an ultrasound, but if, ever, if you've ever seen your own pelvic ultrasound, you don't even know what you're looking at. The MRI is like high definition television. You see things to incredible advantage. Um, it's just because all the gynecologists have ultrasound in their office. That's why they get an ultrasound. And it's a, it's a nice first step to verify, yes, you have fibroids, but we need to see them to better advantage. And we go over the MRI and we put the two things together because occasionally, Somebody will have the right symptom, so say heavy bleeding, but they don't.